The Queen of Anatahan is a very popular Japanese story that took place in 1944 to 1951 on a remote island. It's a true story about how one Japanese woman and 32 men were stranded, and one by one, the men mysteriously died fighting for one woman. What really happened in this island, and why did all of the men next to this one woman all die? Was it jealousy? What does a primal human instinct tell you? This story is so well known in Japan that it has been made into multiple books and movies and it is one of the craziest stories that I've ever heard about and I was like, I have to talk about this. There's so many different versions of the story, like the details kind of vary so I did try to get as much resources as I can. So if you like these stories, the algorithm again has been hitting me hard. So just by hitting the like button, subscribing and commenting all really helps. I want to continue making the stories and you guys, I started a new podcast podcast show called The Green Tea with my co-host Emma Bernier. We have some exciting guests from Millionaire Business Moguls, so Hollywood's biggest music video producers. I will be talking about my lawsuits with my K-pop company that happened back then, so exciting, exciting new talk show. I'll leave a card up here to our first episodes as well. Anatahan is an island in the northern Marina Islands in the Pacific Ocean, and during the World War One, Anatahan came under the control of the Empire of Japan. This island is said to be about only 13 square meters, and it has a lot of active of volcanoes and no there is no humans that occupy or is inhabited by people today but up till the 1990s there were people living there there is constant volcanic eruptions apparently and that's one of the reasons that everybody had to leave the island so back in the 1940s this was during the time of world war ii and if you guys remember your history this was a time when japan tried to occupy different countries in asia including korea and the pearl harbor happened in 1941 when the japanese took a surprise attack on the US. So in June 12, 1944, in the midst of war, a Japanese Navy ship was on its way to Saipan when it was struck by the US missiles. This was a time when the US Air Force was taking multiple bomb strikes against the Japanese, and US started to secure the airfields in Saipan and Guam. During these bomb strikes, one of the Japanese vessels was hit on June 12, 1944. There was only 31 lucky survivors from the strike, and there was one last boat remaining, the survivor boat, and 31 men got on the boat and somehow swam to the nearby island, which happened to be the Anatahan Islands. Majority of the men that survived was the military age, so these were men from 16 to only in their early 20s. Of course, they were young and healthy, so they were able to survive a long trip. Because the island was occupied by the Japanese, the government would send some Japanese people in order to revamp the farming and plantations and oversee the Chamorro workers. Now, it is unclear if out of the native people, the Chamorro people, it was all male or if there were some females in there. But out of the three Japanese workers, there were two men and one female. The leader of the plantation was Kikuichiro Higa and the deputy overseer named Shoichi Higa and his 28-year-old wife, Kazuko Higa. There's some variations in her age, but regardless, she was somewhere in her 20s. Now, this was an island still somewhat far away from Japan and Saipan and all of the big cities, so they didn't really get the news, like the updated news of what was going on in World War II. Maybe they had radios, I'm not sure, but they knew that they were in a war and it was getting pretty bad. Now, before the 31 men arrived, Kazuko's husband, Shoichi, apparently grew really worried about his own sister that lived in Saipan. Now, they did hear the news that now the US was overtaking Saipan or taking control back. They heard some bombing nooses and things like that, so Shoichi really wanted to go and check up on their family, which is understandable. I mean, at least most of you guys that are watching, I am pretty sure that we did not go through war, thankfully, so I'm sure the level of you wanting to check up on your family is just different. So Shoichi said, hey, I'm gonna go back to Saipan. I'll be back in a month, let me just go and check up on my family and see if they're okay. I mean, this is a time of war, like we have to, this might be the last time I can ever see my family. So Shoichi asked his boss, Kikuichiro, hey, please take care of my wife, I will be back, right? I mean, I guess in 2024, we're like leaving your wife with your boss in an island full of no females. At the same time, maybe taking your wife back to Saipan where you might be killed by the enemy and bombings, that was probably way more dangerous than, you know, staying on the island. So I guess I kind of get it. So one day, Shoichi left 
promising to come back. But apparently, a couple months passed. It's been over a month and Shoichi never came back with absolutely zero news what happened to him. And that is when the 31 men would arrive and seek for help and rescue. I'm not exactly entirely sure if Kikuichiro, the boss, and Kazuko actually like fell in love and decided to actually get married or be a couple. Or because the 31 men arrived, that is when they decided to think of a plan and pretend to be married among themselves so that she does not get touched by anybody else, obviously. And thankfully and ironically, they both have the same last name, Higa. And unlike Korea, Japanese woman, apparently just like in the US, takes on the last name of the husband. So it did make sense. But either way, this was also a great protection because you just have people that are coming in that you don't even know where they're from. They might act bizarre and wild. At least they were somewhat civilized and understood that these two were married, don't touch. Now, when the 31 survivors arrived at the island, they were pretty much welcomed. I mean, what else are you gonna do? The island apparently had some bananas or plantains, veggies. They were able to fish as well. So at least in terms of immediate survival when it comes to hunger, it was taken care of. Apparently, the men were even able to take smoke crushed dried papaya leaves, wrap it in the leaves of bananas, and made an intoxicating beverage called the tuba or coconut wine. So I guess they were doing pretty good. They also built huts out of palm fronds and woven floor mattings of pandanas. But as a couple months passed by, I mean, the population is now in the 90s. So they were eating up a lot of things and apparently a couple months passed and they ate up all the livestock, all the immediate vegetations and the things that was flourishing. So eventually they had to rely on taking lizards and snakes and different types of wild animals just to get some meat protein. Because this was during the time of war, they weren't able to get help from the Japanese because eventually they started to lose. The only way to get out of this island was actually by the US, the enemy side in terms from the Japanese. But the native people and especially the Japanese men and the people were terrified of the US. They were like, if we get captured, we're gonna be dead by the enemies. Now is the beginning of 1945, so just a couple months passed since they arrived. And apparently an American B-29 bomber crashed on the island. The people on the island tried to go and see if there was any survival survivors or any enemies that want to attack and unfortunately the American pilots that was inside has passed but they were in luck because there was actually a lot of supplies inside of this bomber it says that the settlers took materials from the plane to make pots pans, dishware, knives, shelter, and even clothing made from the unused parachutes. They even got the oxygen tanks to use it as a water storage. So it seems like they got pretty creative. But one of the most valuable, powerful thing that they found were guns. There was about two guns in there. And in the beginning, the Japanese men used it as, hey, this is our protection. In case the enemy comes, we can use these guns to protect ourselves. But later, we will get to how these guns would actually lead to a power struggle among these men. Not too long after that, Chamuro people from the neighboring islands came to Anatan Island to try and see if there were any survivors. Now in the US, if there are any men down, it is a thing that you have to go and at least reach the bodies. So the other Chamorro people were sent by the US military to try and salvage these bodies. They also realized and reported that there were many people living on Anatan Island. So they reported that back and decided to rescue anybody that was on this island who wanted to leave. Now at this point, food was starting to kind of become scarce and it was not a glamorous place to live. To the Chamorro people, they didn't care. They left. They're like, see you later. But the, to the Japanese people that were stuck there, they're like, no, this is the enemy the u.s is the enemy if we go back they're gonna kill us we're gonna become slaves and they decide to literally hide in the jungle by august of 1945 only a couple months later world war ii would end and that's when the japanese surrendered so apparently the u.s planes drops off some pamphlets like handwritten pamphlets saying that the world war ii was over if you guys need any rescue we can come and get you the japanese people looking at this again said mm-mm this is the enemy, this is a trick. If we go back, again, we're gonna be all killed. Like, hell no. 
Now up till this point, it is a year going on too now. Now by the two year mark, they started to get the hang of things. Now there was a system in order, they knew what to eat, they were fishing, they had some supplies. All they had to do was now just to live and survive and maybe this was their new home. Now that hunger and shelter and routine was taken care of, apparently some other instincts started to kick in. Now with the 33 men kind of settling in, it seems like now they had a little bit of a village system, a little bit of their own world. By now, it was 1946, two years in, and apparently some rumors started to surface among the island, among just the 33 people. I thought that was a little funny, like, Rumors and mental games apparently happened even if as a small group as 33 people. The rumors were that actually Kokiichiro and Kazuko, the original two plantation workers, were actually not married. Now, how did they find this out? The story goes that the husband, I'm gonna just call him Kiku. Kiku started to get jealous of Kazuko as she was talking to other men, just like conversating with them. Apparently, he got really jealous. That's one version of the story. And apparently, because of jealousy, Kiku started to become physical and very mean to Kazuko. And maybe because of that, maybe Kazuko herself, she's talked. She told the other men or some people that she trusted like, hey, actually we're not a real couple. Like he's being mean to me because he's jealous, but I'm like, like he's not even mine. Like he's not even my real husband. Why is he being jealous? So maybe she talked. Maybe, maybe that's the case. We don't know. So that is when the men said, hmm, well, if they're not actually married, let me try to win over her. Now going back, remember at this point, we had those two guns that were found in the US bombers. It's been two years now in the island. And there's no use for this gun to fight against the enemy. So who became the enemy? It was among themselves, a power control. So whoever had the possession of these guns, it meant that they were the most powerful. You can't win against a gun. So there were two men from the 31 survivors that was kind of the leaders and took care of the guns. Now, according to a Korean source, Diva Jessica's story, she says that there was one man that died first among the 31st, and he was the first to go. And apparently he died falling from a tree trying to get some coconut or some plantations. And this guy who died, the first one to go, apparently just was the guy who just had a bad relationship with the two leaders who had the gun. So now this is when the whole mental game starts to come in. This is when there's now competition within the group. Like, oh man, this guy who happened to be in a bad relation with the leaders, he died. Could it be that he was killed? Now I gotta watch my back from anybody else. And the story continues saying that these two leaders with the guns start to feel a little powerful. They went up to Kazuko and said, hey, you know, we're kind of powerful. We have the guns. We can kind of protect you. Why don't we all live together? Kazuko's husband, you know, he couldn't really say anything. He apparently started to feel that mental game as well. Oh, dang, if I don't like compromise or like at least like back down a little bit from these men, I could get killed. They could just shoot me anytime. There's no rules here. There's no judge here. There's no poll police here literally you had to watch her back from people this is literally lord of the fly situation going on and kiku the husband said okay okay sure why not we can we can live together like let's do it i think he really felt intimidated trying to pretty much survive on his own now what was kazuko's standpoint at this moment did she have something to say did she say no i mean could she say no technically she can she was the only woman out of all these men and she kind of just had to go with it probably now some time passed we're not sure how long but one of the men that had the guns the two leaders one out of the two leaders was shot dead and again, there's no witnesses, there's no story, there's no judges, there's no police to write down what happened. And that is when more of these mental struggles and games started to get intensified. Now, one guy died from a gunshot, meaning that anybody can kill anybody at this point. Was it a fight? I mean, was it an accident? Was it like, hey, you ate my bananas, so I'm gonna kill you? Or was it, hey, this is my girl, you gonna do something about it and just shot the guy? Who knows? That is when apparently Kiku, the husband, surrendered Kazuko to the sole leader who had the gun. 
But the next thing that would happen is that that leader with the gun, he himself was reported to have died from drowning. It is said that when the men were fishing, there were big waves that came and sometimes it would take the men and they would drown and die. Was it a cover up? But either way, honestly, at this point, it literally feels like Alice in Borderland. Like maybe they're all lying to each other. Maybe they're all manipulating each other and playing these mind games and kill the leader in secret because they didn't like him or who knows. It is reported then that Kazuko said, oh god, like, I need protection. I need somebody next to me now. Like, there's nobody protecting me. So she apparently went back to Kiko. There's a little variations of stories of what happened to Kiku. According to Kazuko, she says that he died from food poisoning, which is totally possible because we're talking about not as great sanitation here. It is not a great place to live. I mean, I don't even know how they were taking showers. I'm sure illnesses and diseases might have went around. Or you might have a stomach bug and you can't get rid of that. So it's not uncommon or it's not crazy to think that somebody would actually die from food poisoning. But in another variation of the story, some report that Kiku was shot. So either way, he did end up passing. But if one of the men died, she would be appointed a new man, a new husband to be next to her. So she was kind of used as a trophy. I mean, at this point, I don't know. I don't think she really had a say in this at all. Now I'm guessing that at least the strongest suitor got to be next to her, right? I mean, if you have one woman, one person, prize that they can have, I mean, I can only assume that the strongest would go for it. And because of that, there were multiple rivalries. One of the men actually died and was found with 13 stab wounds, you guys. There was clearly some kind of mental struggle that was going on between the small village. Now, by now, there were a couple men that got to be Kazuko's partner, and the last partner apparently happened to drown again from the waves. But somehow, between 31 to 23 men, and most of them, or at least every man that was next to Kazuko as a partner, died mysteriously. There is no report that Kazuko ever got pregnant or had kids or that she was RSA'd. Well, we'll get to that later, which is interesting. So does something happen to her? Was something forced or maybe not? Maybe the men all did behave technically towards Kazuko and that's why she's called the queen of Anatahan. Um, that part was never actually released or I'm not sure if Kazuko kept that as a secret or it was released, but we don't know about it. But if there's no hardcore proof or statements, I don't wanna blame either sides at this point. Eventually, we fast forward to July, 1950. It's been about six years since the men has settled here. And after multiple fights and violence among each other, they've suddenly said, hey, why are we fighting against each other when in fact, Kazuko, the girl, she is the problem. If there is no prize, we won't fight anymore, right? Was it fair to blame one female for their psychosis or for them fighting against each other? So now all of the men that were surviving decided to execute Kazuko. Thankfully, one of the men actually went to alert Kazuko and said, hey, they're planning this. You better run because they're gonna kill you. And Kazuko got the memo and she ran away and hid in the jungle somewhere. So somehow she was able to like flag down a US military plane or a vessel. I guess it was like multiple that was just going passing by because the US was taking control. Now successfully flagging down the help of the US, Kazuko finally in her 30s now, was able to get off the island. She was able to return to Japan and she alerted the Japanese government and people that there were men surviving in the island and they should come and get them. Now, I believe because the war ended and Japanese surrendered, they weren't able to come and rescue themselves. They actually had to have the US military come and rescue the men. And the men didn't believe, they didn't wanna go. And the US planes dropped off the handwritten letters to the men that was in the island saying, hey, the war really is over. This is me, this is your wife or this is your mom come back home they didn't believe them for about a year and finally on july 1951 seven years since their arrival they said okay fine let's go back and finally accepted the help from the u.s vessels and here are the first photos of when they were being rescued and by 1951, when they were being rescued, you guys, there was only about 20 men that survived. So from 31 
about 11 people died. I believe the men youngest were in their 20s and 30s. I mean, it does seem like they also went through a lot as well, like pretty rough. Finally, Kazuko in Japan was able to tell her story and she, I guess, got smart about it and people picked up her story and what happened to her and they were like oh my god this would be a great story for a movie for a book so she got a book deal movie deals and she kind of became like a mini celebrity in japan there were people calling her a survivor a brave woman that survived with all these men and apparently some of the surviving men also wrote books going against kazuko saying that she was a manipulator that she did everything she can to spread rumors to have a new husband next to her there are a couple variation of stories of what happened to Kazuko after the fame. Apparently Kazuko met her original husband, the first husband, and apparently he was married and thought that like each other died. So he went on to get remarried himself and went on to have children. And there's some variations saying that they ended up getting remarried to her original husband. I'm not sure if that's a true story because there's another variation saying that Kazuko went on to a smaller town and remarried to another man. Either way, Kazuko survived and the story blew up in Japan and it's being remade into different films and books and this is all based on a true story you guys to me the story is so interesting because at the end of the day I think this truly shows you that even just among 33 people rumors can spread bad blood amongst each other bad feelings toward each other hatred and anger does exist and this can literally get you to kill one another and it really shows you that the strongest survivor does survive till the end and who knows maybe the strongest isn't physical the strongest might be the actual mental person like kazuko the only female that survived i mean one female surviving versus 33 men that's a pretty good ratio let me know what you guys have thought about today's story if you liked it a like would be really appreciated see you in my next video